gift God gave us is not a gift of healing. There are three major gifts God gave us in the New Testament. And the other two are the byproducts of righteousness. The first major gift God gave us is righteousness. Because righteousness makes us to function as the God kind. What we say is what becomes. And so you may not have gift of healing. But if you know you are righteous, you can command the sick to be well. And it will become. The second gift God gave us is eternal life. So that we can operate in his class. And the third gift he gave us is the Holy Ghost. So that we can know his ways and have intimacy with him. The three major gifts every believer has is righteousness, eternal life, and the Holy Spirit. And righteousness is a power. It's a power. What you call it is what it becomes. We reduce righteousness to right living. I'm no longer fornicating. I'm no longer lying. You don't know the doctrine. The doctrine is not living above sin. Sin is one of it. The doctrine is actually anything you say is what it is. Because you, you make things aligned to God's standard. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Who is this person on this system? It's, a, it's an angel whispering to you. Please keep it down. Keep it. He said, that is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not counting people's sins against them. This is what the Bible says. He said, but counseling it. Canceling it. So God is not counting people's sin against them. He is deleting it. This is Bible. I'm not the one talking. If you want to know why the Pharisees wanted to keep Paul, this is why. Because the Pharisees had records. Somebody has, he fasted for 80 days. And when he's talking to you, he said, Do you know how many years of fasting I have? I fasted for 200 days. I fasted for 10 years. So he feels because of that fasting, God will receive him. The Bible calls that filthy rag. The only basis by which any man stands pure before God is because of Jesus. That's why you cannot out-thank God. When it comes to thanksgiving, you can't outdo God. Because everything you are doing now and you will do tomorrow was already taken care of in Christ. In fact, what you are doing is to appropriate what is already available. Nothing you do can make anything available. Because if you can make anything available, you deserve the glory. But the Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency will be of God and not of man. So nobody can take the glory. Are we together? He said, cancelling them and he said he has also committed to us the message of reconciliation that is restoration to favor with god and so what we said was that god is no longer crediting sin to men's account and it would have been legally unjust for god to do that the lawyers will tell you it's the law of double jeopardy when you were sentenced to death for sinning you died and so if you are judged again it will be against justice in the spirit realm and so the death of jesus dealt with past present future that's why those who come to God and say, I'm sorry, they are not forgiving because they say, I'm sorry. They said, I'm sorry for 1,500 years in the Old Testament. Nobody was forgiven. And so this scripture debunks the argument of you must confess to be forgiven. Nobody is forgiven because he confesses. Everybody is forgiven because they believe in Christ. The reason we are forgiven is because of Christ. Are we together? And so if you come to Jesus and you say, Lord, I'm sorry, it's because you believe that forgiveness is available. If you don't believe it's available, you won't ask for forgiveness. You are asking because you know it's available. So when they say future sins are also forgiven, it shouldn't be new to you. It shouldn't be scary to you. Rather, it should make you grateful to God. So that while God is yet working on you, you will not be sentenced to death. Because the wages of sin is death. Are we together? Do you understand this scripture or should I bring another one? Okay, let me bring another one. Because somebody is saying, Kai, are you sure this part of amplified version they didn't do a mistake <laughs> you know right religion makes it difficult for you to accept things for free you want to do something so that you say it's because of what you did that position is not available okay let's look at hebrews hebrews chapter six chapter eight from verse 12 let me read only verse 12 hebrews it says for i will be merciful and gracious towards their wickedness he's talking about the new covenant and he said and i will remember their sins no more so god is not crediting it and he's telling you now that he will not remember it let me read another scripture romans chapter 4 romans 4 verse 7 and 8 see what the bible said this is why we are audacious i'm trying to explain this to you so that your foundation will be strong because if you don't know this, Satan can come and accuse you. 
and your faith will be up and down, up and down, up and down. Today you are strong, tomorrow you are weak. Because Satan will diffuse you with a language that will kill your faith. He said, blessed and happy and favored are those whose lawless acts have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered up and completely buried. Go to the next verse. He said, blessed and happy and favored is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account nor charge against him. So God will not count it and God will not credit it to him. He said, that man is blessed. So the reason we say we are blessed people, this one of it. And the reason we are forever grateful to Jesus, this is one of it. Don't hope that you will go to heaven because you fasted. See, there is a tricky part to this doctrine. And the tricky part is, if a man is not taught completely, this will make him become lascivious. Because if you study Jude chapter 1, it's one chapter by the way, verse 3 and 4. The, the, the apostles were now contending to defend the faith. He said, because certain men crept in amongst us and they turned the gospel to lasciviousness. These are the kind of men that come to tell you that your future sins are forgiven so you can fornicate. Nothing, God is not concerned. God didn't forgive you so that you can skip sinning. God does not validate iniquity. He does not endorse sin. The Bible said, Thou, O Lord, out of a purer eyes. He said, Your eyes cannot behold iniquity. And so when God forgave you, God did two things in order to make sure you don't sin. Because God is not just about forgiving you. God is actually bringing you to a place where you don't sin anymore. The goal of God is not to forgive you. Forgiveness and salvation became necessary because you fell. The goal of God is for you to walk holy like him. So it's not for you to fall and come back and be forgiven. Fall and come back. So when God took away the matter of sin through forgiveness, he credited eternal life into your spirit. That life now is what makes it possible for you to live above sin. And so the victory of sin is not forgiveness. The victory of sin is quickening. Being able to live and not to sin anymore. That's where God is taking us to. And that's why when I was teaching, and anybody who teaches this, they will ask you the question, should we continue in sin because grace abounds? That was the question they asked Paul. Because Paul said, the grace of God covers for past, present, and future. They now ask him, if this is so, should we continue sinning? And Paul said, God forbid. God didn't stop by just forgiving you. When God forgave you, there were certain things God made available. And I mentioned three to, to you yet, um, last week, Tuesday. I said, number one, when God forgave you, God invited you into fellowship. Now, when you are invited into God's fellowship, because what truncated your fellowship was sin, you now discover as you begin to live in God's ambience, the desire of sin will be mortified. Because the presence of God kills flesh. He said, Samuel hacked Agag in God's presence. Agag is the king of the Amalekites, and he represents a type of the flesh. He said, in the presence of God, Agag was hacked and killed. So what happens to the flesh in God's presence is that flesh is mortified. And so the moment God forgave us, God extended an invitation and brought us into intimacy. So any man who truly understands forgiveness will develop hunger for God's presence. So that hunger for God's presence is the first sign that this revelation has entered your spirit. And if you begin to walk with God, you will discover that the ability to sin will begin to die. Number two, Colossians 2.13 that when man was forgiven, man was also quickened. So the revelation of forgiveness actually activates eternal life. Eternal life will be in your spirit, but dormant until you understand forgiveness. See what the Bible said. It said, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, worldliness and manner of life, it said God made you alive together with Christ. How did he do it? Having freely forgiven us all our sins. And so when God was forgiving us our sins, he was actually activating life in our spirit. And so the moment you understand the revelation of forgiveness, you will discover that eternal life will become potent. Now, that eternal life does something to you. It destroys the sin nature. Because in Romans chapter 8 from verse 1 to 5, you will see Paul's argument. Paul struggled like every one of us. In fact, the point came, Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this vile body? He said, the things I desire to do, I cannot do. And the things I don't want to do, he said, that is what I do. But Paul found a cure. The cure Paul found was a fountain of life that was in his spirit. And so in Romans 8 from verse 1, hear what Paul said. He said, for there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He said, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And he told us how this victory comes. Go to the second verse. 
Mm. He said, for the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, had set me free from the law of sin and death. So the reason you are sinning is because there's a law in your flesh that binds you to sin. That's why even though you wept and made resolution, it was impossible for you. And so what will happen to you when you understand forgiveness is that your gratitude for God is awakened. And so as you begin to thank God and appreciate God for forgiving you, life begins to flow out of you. And what that life will do, like Paul rightly mentioned here, is that it will now mortify the flesh. This is the argument Paul carried even to verse 13. When he said that if that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he said he will mortify the deeds of the flesh. Because sin is not just an act. Sin is a spirit. Sin is death. You can use discipline to manage acts. But when it has its root in the spirit, it will overwhelm you with time. And so the only way you can deal with sin is to go to the root. And what will take you to the root of sin is your revelational understanding of the unconditional love of God manifested through forgiveness. Even in the natural, you can perceive this. If you are owing somebody a debt that you can't pay and somebody shows up and pay, you will just discover this fidelity in your heart towards that person. You will just not want to hurt that person anymore. And for those who are really foolish, they will start learning. Because I've talked before that if you threaten people about hell, they won't stop sinning. We tried it for a long time. Rather, they will start sinning in secret. They will hide sin and come back, coordinate themselves with suit and tell you the fire of God. I was in the room and I was sensing the anointing. <laughs> if you see what he was doing in the room, you will wonder if there's a new type of anointing. Because he just, he's just telling you what you want to hear. And this is scriptural. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, see what the Bible said. He said, these people, they refuse to retain God's knowledge. And so he said God gave them to a depraved mind. He allowed them to a reprobate mind. So anything they want just happens through them. And he began to outline those things from verse 29 to 31. See the things he outlined. This is what one person is doing. He said they were filled, permeated, and saturated with every kind of unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, mean-spiritedness. He said they are gossip, spreading rumors. Go ahead. He said they are slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of new forms of evil. <laughs> the catalog that Satan brought is not enough for them. So they now told Satan, wait, this iniquity that you brought is weak. Let's show you some things. So these ones, they invent iniquity. Are you seeing this? He said, disobedient, disrespectful to parents. And finally, 31. Completing the list. He said, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, or without pity. And see the worst part in verse 32. He said, these ones, although they know God's righteous decree and his judgment, that those who do such things deserve death. He said, yet... They do not only do them, but they even enthusiastically approve and tolerate others that practice these things. So if you think by threatening people with hair and death, they will stop sinning. You are joking. See what stops them from sinning. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. It says, for the love of Christ controls and compels us because we have concluded that one died for all therefore all died are you seeing what this guy understands because jesus died for me me too i'm dead and he said in verse 15 go forward he said for we who now live we no longer live for ourselves we no longer live to please ourselves but we are now living to please him that died for us and so the root and foundation of forgiveness is to quicken this understanding of the love of God. And that's why you need to know that forgiveness is unconditional. When it comes to you by revelation, this will be your conclusion. You become reasonable enough to know that you are no longer living for yourself. So while the presence of God is mortifying your flesh, the life of God in your spirit begins to spring forth like a river and dominating your appetite, you also become reasonable because now you have seen the, the love of the Father. And it doesn't just stop there. Even the power... To keep the devil at bay is also imparted to you. 
Because in Colossians 2.14, it said, He deleted the handwriting of ordinance that was against us. He nailed it to the cross. And he said, Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So a man who understands this is now living in God's presence. The life of God is flowing out of his spirit like a fountain, all of which mortifies the flesh. And then there is an ability to begin to live to please God, which is God's definition of love, becomes his watchword. And over and above that, the assurance that now there is authority over the devils that rule, out, rule over destinies is now with him. So he can fight and push the devil backward and begin to live for God. This is what forgiveness brings us into. It brings us into fellowship with the Father. It brings us into a place where life flows out of our spirits. And it also bring, brings us to a place where we experientially know that we have authority over demons and principalities. On the strength of that, we are persuaded that the love of God has accepted and approved of us. And on the strength of that love, we begin to walk in faith and in boldness. This is the foundation of victorious living in Christ Jesus. A man who doesn't know this, the devil will molest him with presuppositions, assumptions, speculations, accusations, and his life will just be up and down. He will be seeking God every day to have mercy on him. He will be seeking God every day to forgive him. He will be asking people to stand with him to beg God for him, whereas he's already accepted in the beloved. And because he doesn't know and accept this thing, he cannot walk in victory.